So welcome to Your Vice's first ever online event um, in the form of a roundtable. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have three experts in their field with us tonight. Joanna Kopacic, Alistair Heather and Billy Kay. Now I'm not going to go into all of their bios because if you're here then you can access their bios on the Your Vice Facebook page on AY. So um, we're going to be treated to basically myth busting some uh, Scott's questions that have been sent in. Um, so I am going to begin by asking Billy, what does Scott's mean to you? Scott's means to me a uh, my mother tongue that I learned at my mother's knee growing up in Ayrshire in the 1950s. It was the only time we used English growing up was literally speaking to the teacher or the, or the doctor. The rest of the time, 99% of the time, you are speaking a broad Ayrshire dialect of Scots. And maybe Ayrshire was important, guy important, because we had a world-class poet as one of ours. So everybody sung the songs, recited the poems, quoted the burns. So we had that literary precedent, if you like, that gave the language status. And it stayed a, a strong pair to my identity right through and then a university, to my astonishment, going to university to study modern languages, eh, I realised that there was a course on the Scots language at Edinburgh University, circa 1979, 69 and 5, 1970. And I was able to do a course in the history of Scots as part of an English language degree. So that gave me the the covenant in zeal, being an airshireman, the covenant in zeal to tell other folk what they'd missed you on. <laughs> I'm still doing it. And that leads us on to Joanna. You um, are coming at it from, from quite a different way in the fact that you're from Poland, but um, now you work in academia. So um, do you want to kind of answer what is what does Scots mean to you? And I guess what I should have asked was, um, when did you realise that Scots was something that you had to protect? Hmm. Yes, I mean, I, I've got something in common with Billy because uh, I also got exposed to Scots at the university, but it was very far from Ayrshire. Um, I first did my degree in, in Poland at the University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznań. And um, because I became interested in, in language variation and all kinds of varieties of, of English and, and various um, uh, historical um, aspects of how dialects and how varieties of different languages develop. Um, I just wanted to know more about, about that background. And I, I've always been interested in Scotland as a, as a place because it's, uh, it captivated me with, the, with its landscape, with its culture. And um, I discovered that it was in fact possible to do a little bit of, of, of Scots uh, as part of my, my English degree. Um, and all these interests somehow just fell into place. But uh, what I realized when I came to Scotland to work at Scottish Academia is that um, the presence of Scots as a, as a language, as a legitimate thing to study, uh, is still far from uh, universally accepted. So even though it's possible to do bits and, bits and pieces on Scots in Scotland, um, it's, it doesn't really form part of your general education. And that's something that I found quite uh, disappointing in a way. Uh, so now I'm, I'm using my uh, my academic credentials, maybe, and my my expertise in, in the history of Scots, which became my my job, uh, to to campaign for for the recognition and validation of the of the study of Scots as a subject, as a thing in its own right, to continue that fantastic um, uh, history that Billy was talking about and the legacy of people who who did uh, courses on Scots and about Scots and in Scots uh, at Scottish universities in the past. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite privileged and quite proud to be, you know, continuing this this legacy today. Wow. Well, Joanna, you're doing some incredibly important work. As someone that's got a degree in Scots song, it's very difficult to explain to people that I have a degree in Scots song, but Scots is not yet formally recognised. Exactly. Like yes. Language. Yeah. So it would certainly make me feel a lot better. <laughs> Ali, how, um, you know, the same question, but you came into Scots in a different way as well. So tell us that. Aye, so Scots to me wasn't a, wasn't a something that was ever kind of uh, looked down upon. I, we can play the census. I went and looked at my in village the other night, and my road is about 45, 50% Scots speakers. 
it's just it's just a totty wee village in the middle of the Angus countryside. Um, but most of the folk around us when I was growing up were just Scot speakers. It did we didn't hear the same confidence that your likes at Ayrshire maybe does we Ken Rabbi Burns and all that. There was, but what there was was a great tradition, a sang and a music, and Scots was absolutely embedded with that. Also, the boy, the the headmaster at my local primary school, Mr. Henderson, we shout out for him, was he was some boy. I didn't realize at the time how unique he was, but he entered us into Scots language competitions every year and he'd read us Scots stories. So it might be like a bit of a Violet Jacob novel or what have you. Um, but he'd also do something because he himself was fake Carnusty, which is a bit of posher, speak a bit of different, but it's doing the road. So he'd get older folk that were retired, Faye and Newbiggin, Faye the village, to come in and tell us stories and tell us about the language to make sure we got the right dialect. I didn't hear any more because I've been overseas too long. But um, so I was kind of introduced to Scots as a legitimate thing. Like it wasn't, a, it wasn't mm. that big a deal. But I went after high school and there was nothing there. And Ken, it just kind of fell away. It was, it was something I'd use very happily and was comfortable with, but I'd never seen it as something that you could use in life. Ken, it was the thing you just use with your pals and all that. And again, it was university that kind of guard us here real think about Scots, but it wasn't a Scottish university. It was my old girlfriend who was a linguistics student at Victoria University in Wellington. Because she said to us, um, she said to us something about like, oh, English is dead limited because you've only got like uh, these and those. And I was like, aye, but you also got like they in that as well. And, uh, and she was like, oh, and she was asking me these questions about these additional vocab. And she went and asked her uh, lecture about it. And she was tell, oh, no, that's just Scots. There's, not, there's books about that. That's fine. There's articles. And that was the first time that I'd kind of been a scene that actually Scots was something other. It was more than just how folks speak in the village and all that. It's mere, it's mere something that exists in academia. That gave it legitimacy for me. And then through work, I flitted all about Scotland. Faye used to work up in Elgin and in Forres and Dundry, Aberdeen and at the borders in Edinburgh. And I, you hear Scots all over the place. So it's something I just, I picked back up when I got home. So it sounds like your primary school teacher gave you a formative experience of Aye. Scots. And Aye. certainly in the Northeast, um, we had great poets like, well, we have great poets like Sheena Blackhall, Les Wheeler and Ian Middleton. But at primary school, it seemed to be that you did a wee bit of Scots at Burns Week and then it was neglected for the whole year. So anyway, we'll talk more about education later, I think. Um, I would like to ask us all, I mean, we're all different ages here. Um, this question I couldn't answer myself, but do you think there has been a change in the way that Scots has been perceived in the last 20 years? Billy, with all due respect, I'm going to go to you first. Well, as the youngest member of this panel, <laughs> I want to state immediately that I, there's been changes in the last 20 years, but there was changes in the previous 20 years and the previous 20 years before that. There's any reasons to be cheerful, but there's never enough reasons to be totally happy. In other words, there, it's as if sometimes you make one step for it and two steps back. For example, just now, there's no cross-party group in the Scottish Parliament for Scots. Well, there was one that lasted until the last referendum, and then it went underground and hasn't reappeared. So that's a negative thing. You've got an open university course in Scots. That didn't exist. That's new there. You had the census in Scots that we worked hard to achieve. And well, a lot of opposition. And we've achieved that. So that's a positive. So there's a few of positive things going on. Ali's recent television program was another positive. But my series in the 1980s was looked at as a breakthrough in time. But it's as if, it's as if it's a wee holiday. It's that thing about learning a poem, a Burns poem, or about Burns time, or a Doric poem. It's as if it's a wee holiday to reality. And then you go back to the everyday thing, which is the English hegemony. And it has to be a lot more than that. And that's the problem, that I can be guy guy positive about developments, but at the same time, being the oldest in the panel, I've seen it afore, and we need something more concrete for it to gang for it. 
Brilliant. Well, Joanna, I'm kind of wanting to get back to the, the question of how, do you think there's been a change in the way that Scots has been perceived in the last 20 years? What are folk thinking about it? Do we have mace people on side? Is there folk that we need to kind of get room? Um, what, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to what Billy was saying, because I can also trace my journey with Scots 20 years back, believe it or not, but I did my 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 degree uh, with focus of almost exactly 20 years ago, a little bit more than that, actually. So I remember myself as a, as a young, inexperienced PhD student uh, preparing presentations and conference uh, talks on Scots at the very start and always trying to validate why I'm doing this, being asked that question by, you know, the larger kind of academic community, what it is and why why am I actually doing that? Is, isn't there any more kind of standards uh, topic? Why, why am I going so niche with that? And, and why is it interesting? But I always found these questions really puzzling because nobody really questions any work done on, I don't know, Egyptian hieroglyphics, even though people don't really use them for practical purposes anymore, you know, so it's like, why, why would it be difficult to understand why the history of Scots was something that uh, a person from Poland wanted to investigate and delve into and, but, but I, so I've, I think things have really changed since then. And uh, at the moment, there are so many really interesting projects going on with Scots and Focus. Uh, from my historical perspective, uh, there are a, a few really interesting PhD uh, projects going on right now at the University of, of Glasgow, where I work and, and at, uh, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, and there's, there's been this growing interest and the multiplicity of resources that are being produced that can spark off further and further uh, exploration of these things that we didn't really have access to before. So we stand on the shoulders of the people who have come before us all the time, but because of that, uh, we can explore these things even further. So I think the momentum is with us, and you can also feel it in, ac in academia for sure. Ali, what what do you think? Hi, so I'm I'm 30, so I do have a bit of a time to add up and give different sort of stages of experience. But in terms of this is somewhere where data is actually dead useful. Because Google's been scanning all the books, or basically I hadn't been printed for the last 300 years, you can check the prevalence of a certain vocabulary through Google. And you can see really dead clear data visualizations of the UC Scots. And Scots was you had obviously a muckle peak where the 1700s and all the, the smashing writers going about in the, what's generally cried the kind of vernacular revival of that period. Then you hear all the kind of uh, like your J.M. Barry's, your Violet Jacobs, all the, all the writers, you see another great uh, spike and through to the 1920s. But then for the kind of interwar years and through the Second World War, you see this muckle slump where just nobody's publishing anything in Scots at all. And the presence of all that vocabulary in published work isn't there at all. And now, for the book the last 20 years, you can see it really start to pick back up. There's mayor and mayor being published today in Scots. So isn't it back to the glory days of the 1700s? Isn't it back to your Kale Yard era or your Walter Scots or anything like that? But there is now a genuine measurable increase in the amount of Scots being published. And that gives me hope. That makes me think. There is a change going on. We hate a gear lot mayor effort to that. Um, Scots isn't in a smashing position just now. There still isn't enough out there, but the tides turn, and we are now kind of moving with the, in the in the right direction. But Billy's correct. Like we like I can for working up in Aberdeen. There's folk that rocked away at this in the seventies and eighties, and there was there was a perceptive, perceptible change, but it just kind of deed off as soon as they folk stopped working at it. So the new we hit to make sure we activate money mayor than just the, the key activists and get hundreds and thousands and that 1.5 million of Scots speakers engaged and active. Yeah, if, if I can just quickly follow up on this, because I think Ali is, is right in pointing out that the fate of Scots and its, uh, its presence uh, very dependent or has depended so far on uh, the act actions of individuals, passionate individuals like Billy, like yourself. Uh, but 
I think now is the time to really have more structure put into place for people to to be able to recognize that this is a legitimate thing, not just for a handful of enthusiasts with very good credentials and very good you know persuasion and and um, uh, all the activities that that people have done so far. Uh, but it's time, I think, to move on from from individuals to to something wider reaching. I don't know how to do it. Maybe you know this panel can have some ideas, and maybe this is the work to be done. Uh, but certainly, I think that's that's the way forward. Yes, absolutely correctly right. And I think in terms of structure and organisation, we have a lot to learn for um, for the Gaelic language community. We can learn off of them. Um, just another wee side note: every time that um, someone mentions Violet Jacob tonight, you have to take a swig of whiskey or whatever you're drinking. I think that's, no, I'm joking, it's just it's been two times already. Um, <laughs> so I thought I would just like to, there's a lot of, the thing is, is that Scots on an international stage is growing and growing and growing. We have people translating Harry Potter into Scots. We've got people releasing albums in Scots. We've got people touring all over the world, working globally within Scots, broadcasting in Scots it's more international than it has been forever because we're mere mobile with social media. Um, but we might hear people tuning in tonight. We've got 91 folk already. So if you're tuning in, I'd love you to be able to comment far you're tuning in, Faye. Um, and if you've got any thoughts, questions, we are here to basically energize discussion. We want to answer these questions and ultimately answer the question, where have we been and where we're going? But going back to basics, I think I'd like to maybe ask is, what is Scots? Billy? Scots is the Germanic language that came a lang way English, its cousin language, into the British Isles around about the 7th century, went to what's now the borders of Scotland uh, in the 7th century. And when it got to Scotland, it fund other languages, it fund Welsh, it fund Gaelic, it fund Norse, that eventually the language of the Lowlands developed into, originally it was called English, and it was a branch of Northumbrian English, but gradually, through the status it gained by being the language of the Stuart Kingdom of the Scots, it was cried Scots to differentiate the English. Gavin Douglas was one of the first people to get the status of the national name Scots. It's been that ever since. So it's been around for a long, long time, since the 7th century, and it's uh, new, uh, a language that's got a great literary tradition, it's got a great spoken tradition in a few different uh, important dialects, but it lacks its status. It's never had enough status for a long, long time, and that's what our vice is trying to do, is to try and give it status, and to try and make everybody that does have their mother tongue and the 1.5 million at least have it, they make them realize what they've got and to insist that they get that, that language is cherished and is gaining their status in the skills, in the media, in society in general. So only thing that can help that gain in a status, normalization is the word across Europe, the use to describe a uh, languages that have hitherto been in a position to come into a mere normal everyday position. And that's what we need to do with Scots. It's there, it's Runa Buttas, it's got Vir, it's got Smedham, it's got beautiful sangs, it's got fantastic poetry. It's all Runa Buttas. With it, the only thing that lacks is status. Joanna, what is Scots? <laughs> I think any definition is always uh, open to interpretation and it can be very general and it can be very detailed. So, so Billy has given us a very detailed and historically informed definition. So if I may go in, in the other direction and give you a very general definition. So what is Scots? I think the easiest way to say that that's a manic spoken in Scotland or used in Scotland because I don't want to exclude uh, written Scots and say, no, it's, it's only, it only exists in the spoken realm. Uh, I'm very much interested in, in the written text because of my historical kind of interest in the language. So I'm dealing with written text rather than the spoken language. But anyway, it's a West Germanic language used in Scotland, the Orkneys, the Shetlands and Ulster. Uh, and it's one of the three ind indigenous languages of Scotland. And, and I would say that that suffices as a general definition. 
And you would notice that I don't hesitate to use the word language. And this is something that many people would you know, question uh, and, and raise all kinds of issues with, with um, anybody calling Scots uh, a language. So from a, from a point of view of, of uh, where we sit as, as linguists in this whole debate, I I think not a question of um, some kind of proof or, or argument that I could use here, because the label of language is a uh, is a cultural label. So, uh, as B Billy was saying, if the variety that people use has enough status, people very easily associate it with a with a standard, and we tend to give the label of a language to standard languages. But the the situation is much more complex, um, and uh, in terms of Scots and why uh, it, I would give it the label of a language, even though it doesn't necessarily have an overt standard, is that uh, I think the language label has a very powerful cultural, uh, historical, ethnic, uh, literary connotations. And we shouldn't uh, deny that label uh, to a variety that enjoys all these things, even though it may be mutually intelligible to some extent with other varieties, because it's a related variety, as we know, uh, for example, uh, as Billy pointed out, because of its historical relation to English. Um, but it's also quite uh, quite close and, and very much influenced by other uh, Germanic languages, like um, you know the Scandinavian languages that came to Britain uh, at some point. So Scots has all kinds of influences, and it's it's a it's a variety. It's a it's a means of communication that people use that has its own linguistic. Um, characteristics, plus the ethnic, the cultural, uh, the historical background that makes it a distinct thing in its own right. Um, so that's why I'm not hesitating to call it a language, because that's the, the label that we could easily apply to a variety that has all these things. Hmm. Well, Ali, um, these 12 have answered that perfectly. I <laughs> what is Scots? <laughs> Uh, what I mean, is Scott, Ali? Tell I can't, I can't beg any mere stains upon the perfect Kearney knowledge they have put together there. Like that is, aye, that's what Scott says. So I'd say just for myself, there's maybe folk watching this that, like me, come to actually write in Scots, knowing until they're in their 20s, that sort of thing. Like maybe they're a wee bit older. They, they speak Scots since they're wee, but they can't write in it. And when you hit sit down and you hear that kind of gun to your head, a right, what you're about to write is Scots. Write Scots for somebody. Then you hit a make a decision about what is Scots. Ken, is it just the way you speak? No, really, it's it's more than that. Like written Scots is something else. So when I hear to define Scots with that, again to in my head, I conjure I, I think about I think about the Falkarunas that I already talked about in Angus that are the Scots speakers that Ken, they're the folk that I love, they're my old neighbours, they're my pals, they're my family. So I think I think about them and I think then I think about the literature, which I was raised we, but it's out there for Abdi, like I mean, another swig for the Violet Jacob, but all your all your great Scots writers that are out there, your Burnses, your Hubic Dermids, even your no so good Scots writers, your J.M. Barrys and all that, they're all part of the culture. They're all your Ali Bally Bees and all that kind of stuff. It's all so you hear that, and then you also hear this uh, the concise diction of the Scots lead. You hear the online resources like Scots Online and the Open University courses and all that kind of stuff. So when I sit down to intentionally scrive out a wee article in Scots. I had the three data points to kind of guide my guide my journey. So it is Scots if it is true to all the three data points. I think that's how that's how I navigate myself in it anyway. That is absolutely brilliant. I mean, coming at this um, from a ballad singing perspective, a folk song perspective, you can only just have a wee listen to some of the body ballads written and recorded in archives of the northeast of Scotland to see. Mm -hmm. Just Fu Strang, the Doric is up there. And of course, Doric's uh, another kettle of fish. Um, so we've had some comments going in on Facebook and uh, Kenneth Hutchison has kind of nailed the, put the nail in the head saying that the only way to get a future is to hate it we a correct standardized version and taught in our schools as a discrete subject and gain full legal recognition and protections the, the like that Gaelic has. I mean, that involves structure. And I think that we, Ali? So just on that, so hello, Kenneth. Good, good point on that. Uh, just about that hangy, the, the new, when they're teaching Scots in schools, you're teaching it, we, an emphasis towards the dialect, right? 
because there is the presumption that in many schools, the bairns already hate an affinity with that dialect. So it's a bit easier. If you are in the Northeast, you didn't teach them general Scots to start with. You teach them their dialect and use that as a gate to Gangdun on the route back to a mere general understanding of Scots. So in Shetland for words, they'll tack you fay the dialect to the lead. I can, that's a bit of backwards about how other leads do it. Like with Gaelic, when I was learning that, you do maybe twice years of general Gaelic then to a dialect. But I, I, I agree with Kenneth on just about that in there, but I am not sure that you hate to start for a central standard Scots and get out for there, given that there's already dialectal knowledge in the community. But I'm happy for Billy to correct us. Well, no, I think you start with what the Wains have when you're teaching them. Aye, aye. What the gentleman asks for is, is quite a distant in the future. I would love to have the same thing. I would love to have a standardised language. And there's even as early, as late as the 20th century, the Norwegians did that. We, four, two, two examples of the rain tongue, in fact. So it can be done, but it's, it would need a political and cultural will to do that. And that's a crucial thing in this discussion. It'll not happen without independence. Simple as that. Nothing will happen major like this without independence. Because even the parties that should be supporting it are slightly fear to it to, to some extent because of the backlash they'll get to the press if they promote anything ethnically Scottish. So I would love to see, I would love to imagine, I, I can imagine in say 20 year time, we get a referendum next year and we get independence. I can imagine in 20 years time, I may still be alive just seeing Scots taught as a standard language in the skills. But it, the Catalans talked about uh, taking about three generations to remove the slave mentality after the death of Franco, after democracy was re-established in Catalonia. Well, it would take a generation or two for us to get our culture and perspective, because it's a warped perspective that our been folk have about our culture just now. If you write on and about Scots, on social media, you can that, because you can some folk that just hate it, or think they hate it, and express that hatred, and they are native Scots. So we're a long way to go, but I wish we could be in a, in a, in a place where in 10, 20 years we could have a, a standardised Scots taught in all over, the, all over the country. So I'm going to go to Joanna, but just one, one wee question that ties in perfectly with what you're saying, Billy. Um, someone um, asked, can we all agree that we should depoliticize Scots? Now it's very difficult because um, we don't want to be pushing Scots as only an SNP nationalist agenda. No, we want to be pushing Scots as, as a Scots thing, as something to do with our identity and culture. And I feel uh, personally, this is my own view, but that we should depoliticize it in order to make it accessible to most. Now, I'm not, not taking names in it, but some of the greatest advocates for the Scots language are um, members of the Scottish Parliament um, who, who align with Tory values, who are Tory M MSPs. And I think that we don't want to alienate those folk. And it's half a tricky, but I'm going to shut up now and go to Joanna. Okay. Uh could I just uh, give Billy the opportunity to maybe respond to that point? Because yes, you, you were itching to say something, Billy, so <laughs> please go for it. Hey, it was just the fact that I would love it to be non-political. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it's becoming mere and mere political. A phenomenon that's happened just, I've just been reading the novels of John Buchan and Robert Louis Stevenson, who write in great Scots, mm -hmm. of the 20th century. People like Buchan were proudly Tory, proudly Scottish, culturally Scottish, and identified with Scotland within the British Empire. They were Scottish and British. The present day, a lot of people who support uh, the political union today are British, and their Scottish identity is almost subsumed because they're feared of the Scottish political identity associated with it. So I would love, I would love to depoliticize Scots. And the Gales did that very successfully and uh, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. 
But unfortunately, the negativity against Scots quite often comes from people who are politically against a lot of things Scottish. So can I, can I now continue from, from that thought? I think it's good to be inclusive. I think it's good to be representative of the whole Scottish society. And that's something that attracted me to our vice as a movement, because I don't feel that it is promoting any particular view and my, my personal and my political views might align with, uh, you know, a particular persuasion. But, but at the same time, I've got Scots as the um, uh, thing to study and get excited about uh, at the forefront of what I'm, what, what I'm doing uh, in, in this particular capacity. Um, so, so yeah, I, I would like it to be, uh, to continue to be as inclusive as it, as it is right now. And, and Billy did mention the cross parity um, movement uh, and the advisory group uh, for the Scottish Parliament, which was in, uh, put in place uh, earlier. So I think there is scope for that kind of collaboration. Um, and to come back to the question about the standard, um, I think many people associate the standard with something that is quite monolithic and it kills off variety. And that's very true in many cases, but I, d I don't think this ca has to be the case. In fact, when you look at the standard language that we use to communicate right now. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, we've lost Billy there. Technical so hitch. I will continue this thought while you're trying to sort <laughs> out the, <laughs> the, the um, technical glitches. So talking about the standard and the English standard that we use uh, in writing, it is some kind of an agreed version of English that nobody really uses as such from, the, you don't grow up using standard English, right? Uh, you have to be taught it at school, but it doesn't necessarily kill off your own way of talking, your own way of communicating. Uh, and I don't think in the long run, uh, if the standard of, of, of Scots is to be developed, which I don't think is really a necessity. Maybe, maybe the kind of pluri, um, pluricentric linguistic status that Scots may enjoy would be the way forward. We don't know. We, we will have to see what the community really um, sees as useful. And it should be a bottom up thing and it should, it, it shouldn't necessarily be a top down approach. There shouldn't necessarily be a council, uh, uh, you know, ways of doing things because there are as many appropriate ways of doing things as there are speakers and writers of Scots at the moment. So it might be useful to develop some kind of a uniform way uh, of, of writing things, but we will never have a uniform way of saying things, just like we don't have a uniform way of saying things in English. I speak a very different type of English than most of you, but uh, I'm pretty sure we can, you know, understand each other in writing and, and I hope in speaking as well. So I hope that's, that would be possible for Scots. Um, but I understand that the main um, kind of thought behind that question from Kenneth was that standards carry value and that's the status that we would like to give to to the Scots language and some people think it is only possible through standardization so that's one way to do that but I I think it may not be the only way uh, this kind of pluricentric approach has worked for many people uh, and in many contexts and maybe that's another thing to explore um, so I wouldn't get discouraged I guess that that's what I'm trying to say that the lack of a standard shouldn't throw us off the course it, it, and it shouldn't you know stall us in um in the um in the pursuit of of validity and norma normativity that's something that ali and, and billy were talking about later uh, earlier sorry i'm getting a little bit uh no no, no don't worry we have some great comments coming yeah. in can i just um, jump in very quickly on on that hill on that debate there yeah, just, yeah go. I, I hate the impression. I can where Billy's coming from. Absolutely, I don't want to get this out of my system before he reappears. Right? <laughs> uh, I can where Billy's coming from, and there's hundreds of good reasons to for to tack that kind of mere political approach. Your vice is tacking a political approach in that's trying to influence the political system. But may stay the first wave Scots agitators from the seventies were all pushing dead hard for devolution as the key to a Scots lead act and to Scots being guide status, right? And 
they were that gutted with the 79 vote that failed. There was a load of folk before that saying, if we get that 79 devolution vote and we pass that and we get we're in parliament again, then Scots will naturally rise up to be the mother tongue or the, the mere confident politically existent Scottish nation. Now that didn't happen. When we got Holyrood, that didn't equate immediately to a better environment for Scots. And I didn't think that independence equals a good time for Scots. Um, I think that we'd hate to do all this work, whether we're independent or no. We'd hate to give folk the confidence back. We'd hate to, I think Billy's absolutely bang on. We're getting through two or three generations. And as you say, getting some sort of standard together, I quite comfortably ignore standard English. I'd probably quite comfortably ignore standard Scots just the same. Uh, I think it's all, you're absolutely right, tacking 15 different approaches and together all the different approaches will appeal to different parts of the Scots speaking communities that are out there and will engage them in different ways. Because you, you will not get Fisher Boys out of Peter Heed signing up to Scots as a movement if they see it as being part of a drive for independence, which will put Ken, I think. Um, so I'm just going to say that the key word that I'm picking up is confidence. Now, what happens when kids are going to school and they're speaking like Doric or whatever, or Scots out in the playground, and then they go into class and they're still taught to no speak like that? Just um, a comment on Facebook came up uh, by Jamie Fairbairn said, a good uh, bra speaking lassie in my class just yesterday told me that she was tell up at primary school for speaking Doric just a couple years ago. Um, so it's still a problem in the fact that folk are, are telling telling you not to speak like that. Like that. Do you think a language act will um, give people a legitimacy in, in terms of their identity? What, what do you think, uh, Joanna? I, I think so. I think that would definitely um, raise the social awareness of the fact that Scots is not something to be punished, to be beaten out of your system, you know, as, as we've heard repeatedly, these horrible stories, it just makes me shiver, you know, to think that children can be uh, somehow punished for, for, for using the language of, the, of their home and, and their confidence just plummets and they don't achieve much as learners. And I think that's a real issue for the Scottish society and I think the, um, the, the the kind of approach that right now is being taken by Education Scotland to to close the attainment gap between pupils by um, encouraging more confidence in, in the use of their home language of those pupils home language is really taking it uh, in the right direction and uh, in fact to give a shout out to to Jamie Fairburn for the fantastic work he does in Banff uh, in in his uh, school you know teaching geography through the medium of Scots and using these fantastic Scots terms from you taken from your landscape taken from from the weather uh, using that language as a legitimate tool to discover not just literature, not just poetry. I mean, I, I'm saying just, but not in terms of dismissing these forms of expression. I'm just saying Scots is much more than that. It can be used as the language of, 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 of geography. It can be used as the language of discussion on political issues. It can be used as the language of, of commerce. You know, you, you see all these examples of Scots everywhere. Sometimes people frown upon it, you know, because they th think it's a language of tea towels, right? So when you go uh, down Royal Mile in Edinburgh, you see Scots everywhere, but it's not embraced as part of something that can be legitimately used um, in, a, in a context of, you know, trade deals and, and stuff like that. So I think that's the sense of confidence uh, in taking that language from something homely and making it something that works in an official context, be it the context of a school or the context of, of uh, business discussions or con the context of political discussions. Just it will take some time, but with people like Jamie and, and everybody else who's doing the groundwork with the kids at the moment at school, um, as I said, I think we're going in the right direction. Ali, what, what do you think? There isn't a getting away from the fact that that anecdote for Jamie there is poison. Like that is, that's awfully dangerous to only, to only language. That would be an indication that the summit guy rang we, the way that we're approaching it. I tend to be more positive about language. I tend to focus on kind of the reasons to be cheerful as Billy, Billy cried them earlier on. 
but you kind of get away from the folk. Like I was speaking to a primary teacher, no salang sign, who had helped me. Oh, I did, I did a bit of burns. I know I get the I get my pupils to correct it into proper English. <laughs> and it's and I had a lassie, I've told this before, but uh, when I was I was running uh, classes for new teachers in Aberdeenshire, uh, teaching them about uh, Ken. Help, they were all, most of them Kent a bit of Doric already, but it was made about legitimizing it, teaching them about the resources, telling them about the Scots language policies and tell them it's fine new users, are fine to teach Doric or teach in Doric or whatever you fancy. And uh, any of the lasses at the end of the day, she was fair the broch, she started greeting because she'd been told that morning for her mother that she couldn't be a teacher if she didn't learn to speak proper. So I, and that's in the Northeast where it's mere, mere positively disposed to Scots than you'll see in some parts of the Central Belt. He's back. Boy, he's back. Hey. hey. Uh, I was just making a fantastic point, Billy. You've just missed it. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll pick up on that uh, in terms of teachers. I think this is a really crucial um, cohort of, of, of people who have to be on board in order to uh, change the perceptions around Scots because teachers talk to parents and then parents can boost the confidence uh, of, of children uh, at home. So I think uh, the, the kind of groundwork that needs to be done uh, to boost the teacher's confidence and to make them aware of the resources that exist. And that's something that I think the academics can provide as well. And we at Glasgow University, we are actually doing quite a lot of outreach activity with teachers. Um, and various CPD sessions involving some of the resources that we have produced. Uh, for example, you know, uh, Jennifer Smith's fantastic Scottish um, syntax atlas, uh, Scotia, which is available for free and people can just look at the patterns, the, the grammar, the words, the, the constructions that are typical of where they live in Scotland and just investigate that topic a little bit further, use it as an educational resource. I think that's invaluable and it didn't exist, you know, uh, until quite recently. So making people aware of the things that are being produced, are being put in place to boost the confidence and to give people the, the resources to use in, in their work with, with children, that's, that's really important. But if I can continue from, from there and just make one more point, what I've noticed is that there is a lot of work going on right now uh, in the primary sector and the secondary sector. And we did say uh, academia, the universities are producing PhD students. Uh, we are fostering the culture of, uh, you know, looking at Scots as a thing to study in its own right. But there isn't a university in the world that offers a legitimate uh, recognition in the form of a degree in Scots or in Scots and Scottish culture. Uh, I know that there are degrees in Scottish literature, that's all fine, uh, but Scottish literature is a, is a different thing. It's a, it's a, it's a much broader um, construct in terms of uh, literary production. It can in include anything from Scots to Scottish English and, you know, depending on how you, how you define it. But in terms of, for me as a linguist, um, the lack of that sort of provision is, is quite dangerous because at the moment we are producing new generations of hopefully confident speakers who at some point might say, you know, in order to thrive in the, in, in the outside world, in the adult world with my Scots, what is my qualification? Where do I get it? You know, what, what can I do? Can I go and study it at the university? Uh, how do I become a teacher of Scots in the future? Where am I to pick up these these skills? Where am I to pick up a certificate or a or or a diploma or, or indeed um, a degree in that in that field? And it doesn't exist. So I think it's on us in academia right now to use this momentum and really to to um, campaign for um, the possibility of you know to open. Um, degrees and postgraduate courses and postgraduate degrees uh, in, in, the, in the field of Scots broadly, broadly conceived. And I know that Open University has really uh, been su successful with their, with their course and we are opening these opportunities uh, more and more. But, you know, it's high time one of the ancient universities in Scotland put that on their agenda and I'm, I'm very hopeful it's going to be Glasgow. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's all in the future, but I think we are going in the right direction. And saying that you guys are doing this pioneering work and being able to offer um, degrees in Scots, you know, giving people the skills to be able to teach in Scots, we can't forget that there are things like the School of Scottish Studies, which 
it's not um, what you're saying, you know, equipping people to like, you know, teach Scots or whatnot, but what it is is allowing people to, to study Scots in terms of folklore or kind of oral history or whatnot, um, doing ethnology, and that's great. We, we might not have had that if it wasn't for, of course, Hamish Henderson. So there has been steps. Absolutely. A lot, a, lot, a, way, a, lot, a long way to go. So um, that kind of takes me on to the next question. So we're talking about the confidence of Bairds to be able to speak Scots. Now, a lot of the time, if you're switching on the TV or switching on what, Netflix or whatever, unless you're seeing Alistair Heather's face there, then it's most likely that you're going to not hear or see much, um, much Scots um, language um, within your mainstream TV. I'm talking your big heavy hitters, your big dramas. There are folk um, like Richard Madden, he was in the bodyguard and he fought to, to speak in his Scots language, but there's no many actors that have that clout. Now, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of Outlander, but I'm just saying that if kids are turning on the TV and all they're seeing is American or you know whatnot, then how are they going to be able to identify, see, if they, if they turn the TV on and folk, mere folk were speaking Scots, presenting Scots, then they'd have a little bit more confidence about themselves. So the next question that I'm going to ask you all, you all is, how can we get Scots used more often in the mainstream context, not as novelty, but as something that can happen more in the public sphere? Billy? Uh, again, the, the difficulty is the people who control the, the media and the main outlets I know for a fact that uh, a wonderful Scots writer was uh, the late Janet Paisley, who died just a couple of years ago. Wonderful lady, great Scots screever, great Scots speaker. And uh, I remember Janet, her telling me that when she was writing stuff for River City, then she had to anglicise it out of Scots. And there was quite a strong push there. Now, the actors would then Scotticise it again in their own accent, but the insistence almost was that there wasn't any distinctive vocabulary, or if it was, it was Scots light. So until you've got people making cultural decisions that this is something that's indigenous to Scotland and deserves this wider uh, uh, outlet, then you're going to have run against uh, these problems. And you're right, as soon as... Scots is broadcast regularly on television and in radio, then it's normalised and children uh, see that they can, it can be part of their everyday culture. But again, it'll take big changes in Scottish society for that to happen, because the, the, the kind of people making the decisions don't agree with that at the moment. I was in the cross... the the Ministerial Working Group for Scots that, uh, that Mike Russell set up, a few years ago. And one of the, the major things we said was we wanted more broadcasting and scores. And, you know, very little came out of it. The one thing we did want was a, uh, an advisor in every region in Scotland in education. We wanted six, we got four. And at the moment, I think there's only two still working. So these are the kind of steps forward and steps back that I've experienced myself, that, yep, yeah, we need to normalise it and we need to make folk realise that it is there, it is vibrant, it is alive, and it needs to be broadcast like any other living thing. You are. Well, one thing I noticed on, on the recently opened channel, BBC Scotland, is that Scots is becoming um, somehow more, more present um, but it, I'm not sure whether the, the, this broadcasting station actually has any particular policy or any particular way of investing in, in the promotion of, of Scots. Maybe it's more kind of accidental. And I know that, for example, Ali's program uh, was broadcast on that channel and it was very successful and, um, you know, met with a lot of um, uh, recognition and, and and people responded very favorably to it i hope uh, i'm sure it got all kinds of reactions but ali knows best how to deal with those uh but i i have a genuine question coming from a perspective of someone who 
is a little bit of an outsider, you know, with, with, with all my involvement right now um, in, in the activism, of course, I'm, I'm really careful not to tread on anybody's toes and not to antagonize people because we, we ultimately care about the same thing, the promotion of, of Scots uh, as a legitimate thing. But I've noticed that people have a very strong reaction against the question of subtitles. So I come from a place where uh, subtitles doesn't necessarily create such a big um, association with, I don't know, um, a language that people don't understand and therefore it has titled. In fact, in, in fact, it says the fact that you're subtitling something says that it is a, a separate thing that no, not everybody understands. And personally, um, even with related languages, even with, with, with something that doesn't necessarily have exactly ha, have minimal intelligibility and you really have to subtitle it because uh, otherwise you wouldn't be able to understand. To me, producing programs about geography, um, uh, the animal world, the political parties in Scots, but not saying, okay, we, we all have to understand Scots right now because we uh, And instead, putting on English subtitles on a Scots program, I mean, I would welcome that very much. I mean, I understand I have a working knowledge of Scots and I would still uh, appreciate uh, the subtitles just to say it is a different language. Why should we pretend that is, it is mutually intelligible for, for everyone? So I think maybe being a little bit less um, concerned about, um, I don't know, um, the kind of prejudice that is around subtitling. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, you, what my, my co-panelists think about it. Is this a controversial thing to say? But no, I don't um, think so. I, th I, you know, I think, if, for example, a if a, a, a passage from Burns or from medieval Scots or even somebody speaking a dialect that's not broadcast very often, it should be subtitled, but it should be subtitled in Scots. That's, that's the thing. As long as the subtitles are in Scots, then people can then read if they, they find it difficult. I think that would be the way to do it. Mm -hmm. eh, so that they've got the, the visual and the, the oral way of, of appreciating it. That's what I would, I would like. I agree, because, Joanna, what you're chatting about is, Ken, if you're watching, if you're in Poland and you're watching a film in German and it has Polish subtitles, what's happening there is something different because both their languages are established and, hey, they're speaking bass and all that, and what you're doing is just looking to mediate your way into that film. In Scotland, we hate to accept that Scots isn't in that state the new. So we hate to go through a process a See Shetlandic Scots. When I got a bookie, Shetlandic Scots at the library before lockdown, it was a bit of a chaff to get through. Like it wasn't, a, it wasn't a that, because I, I didn't ken, I've no spent time in Shetland, I didn't ken that many Shetlandic Scots speakers. There was hundreds in there that was unfamiliar to me. But see if there was a program that I could sit down and watch and it had Scots subtitles, that'd give us such a help to get into. And it also helped me understand the differences with Shetlandic and the similarities with it. But I yeah. no subtitles. I don't think I don't think it's a massive issue. I don't think it's a massive issue. But I know folk get riled yeah. up about it. But us panelists are that reasonable. We would never get in, or, ourselves all rad. <laughs> no, I, know. I would welcome subtitles, definitely, either in English or in Scots. So coming back to getting Scots into the mainstream, we've had a comment about um, saying, is there any scope for activists to map programmes and videos to be distributed outside mainstream broadcast media? Now that has been happening. Um, absolutely. So I'm just going to quickly do a few, not plugs, but I'm just going to put huh. for it what I'm thinking. Um, last year, we had the first ever Scots Language Awards, or Scots Lead Awards, and they were organised by Simon Tumour and the Hands Up for Trad team. Now, Hands Up for Trad primarily deals with the traditional music sector, um, which of course takes Scots and Gaelic song into consideration. Now, the first ever Scots Language Awards was, it was a great night. It was really, really special. And folk were comparing it to the first ever Trad Awards when folk were meeting up that had only met each other on Twitter. So we need made of those events to get Abdi together. But saying that, um, hands up for Trad, have indeed commissioned you, Ali, to the three programmes, I think. Is that right? Can you tell Abdi about that? Ah, sure. So I did the Kenner's plug in this, but I'm more than happy to. Um, so hands up for trads, Peter, because 
We were meant to be hearing the, the awards for the Scots League in Dundee on, I think, the 10th of September. Obviously, we can't all get together in the same room now, which is a scunner. So what we're doing, and just, just for just now, to keep the kind of uh, kettle boiling, as it were, we're hearing the next for next Thursday on for the next three consecutive Thursdays. I'm getting together in a conversation like this. We felt that are doing new things in the world of Scots. Um, so any of them, for example, is somebody that his name isn't that wheel Kent within kind of the Scots lead movement in the new, but he's a boy called Ross Sires. Uh, and he, and I promised to learn how to pronounce his surname before the interview. And he's producing quality young adult fiction in Scots. And it's hitting a market that isn't really filled the new. We hey, the Gruffalo in Scots for Bairns. We hey, uh, Ken, there's there's a few bits and Bob. Peppa Pig, all that good stuff. But we didn't hey, as you say, independent learners. When you when you get out of primary and you want to attack your learning in its own direction for your 13, 14, 15 year olds, there isn't some big kisty uh, literature to gang through. So he's producing new stuff. So he's speaking to him, we're speaking to Don Leslie, and we're speaking to Ashley Douglas, who are all doing dead different, but dead interesting things around Scots. And basically, most of them are involved in creating that new media. I agree with Billy that we hate it. I don't know, like, you've all been off kind of with the documentary, but we hate a mind that Billy did a documentary, no dissimilar to that in the 80s. I've done mine. Scottish documentaries on the BBC are sort of like stagecoach buses in rural Angus. You get one along every 40 years and then nothing. Um, so we can't, I wouldn't get more excited about one totty wee programme on a channel that nobody watches. Like, it, you hate to hear mere quality media out there, but the day's media landscape is mere diffuse. So, like, folk engage with, it isn't just BBC One on there. Like, you can hear podcasts, blogs, bits of young adult literature. And the thing we're doing right now is per a, a modern media landscape. So, aye, there's mere, of course, your institutional media has a lot to, uh, lot to do, but we can also be the change we want to see as far as media concern, as media goes, aye. Absolutely. And now with social media, we're way more mobile, we can get things out. And one woman who is doing that from her house herself is Jen Lick William, who has set up Doric TV. Um, so being for the North East, I'm very biased towards that. And she has interviewed um, several different, she's done heaps of stuff. She's done cooking shows in Doric. She's interviewed Dame Evelyn Glennie. I mean, like she's been doing amazing things. We just need to signpost to them. That's the thing. It's about supporting Abdi and giving them that wee retweet because that's all that it is. We don't need our own television company to be making content in Doric or Scots. We don't need that anymore thanks to social media. So a lot of folk would say that we are in a much stronger position right. now to get where Scots Language Act than Fike were back in the 70s, 80s, 90s because of the development of social media. Right. So um, in terms of social media, something happened yesterday which has blew up the internet. Reddit, if you're unaware, is a forum-based thing where folks speak about Ahan, right? You can read it, there's a Reddit thread for Ahan. Um, but yesterday there was a wee bit of stushy um, in the fact that somebody pointed out that I, the Hale Scots Wikipedia is kind of guff. Gonna be honest, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Oh, and on that note, Ali Zawa. Anyway, um, we've had a few um, questions um, that's come in because of that. And I think that it's the elephant in the room that we should probably address tonight because Scots language in the past 24 hours has had a, so, so much, um, you know, in the press and everything on Twitter, it's been great because any publicity is good publicity as long as we're, <laughs> as long as we're being nice. So what, this is an anonymous question that came in anonymously. Here we go. The foundation of Scots Wikipedia has been laid by a non-speaker, albeit clearly providing an example of bad Scots. Given that a Wikipedia page ordinarily requires hundreds or even thousands of contributors to function, how do we ensure it is edited to be representative of good Scots? And what is good Scots? Ali, can I go to you first? I 100%. No, of course, it's a, good, it's a good story. It's perfect for social media attraction, but really fundamentally, nothing of significance happened there. It's made a story about Wikipedia than is about Scots. Like, 
Wikipedia is all about a community that values the stuff that's on there contributing to it. The reason some young lad over in America was able to just kind of guy a wee bit of mental we and they thousands of articles is because nobody was engaging with it. Nobody was reading them. Kenny was just off on his own wee world, then his own wee thing. As soon as the Scots community chooses to value Scots Wikipedia, then we'll just gang through it and map all the corrections ourselves. There's no Scots speaker under the sun that would have looked at Oniton, he'd scream it and think, oh, that's legitimate, I'll believe that. And any of the things is, it wasn't the Scots just itself that was bad, it was also all the content was sort of fish, like no trustworthy. Like, I wouldn't have write all Scots Wikipedia after with this, because I did gang through a few of the more uh, prominent pages and things like Rabbi Burns's entries and entries on various kind of Ken Speckle figures in the Scots lead had dozens of different contributors, that hundreds of citations, the whole thing was legitimate. Recently for work, I've had to be using a bit of a Lithuanian Wikipedia. And it's, we're, we're, we're taking a wee bit of an Anglo-centric view of this. Joanna O'Ken for the Polish Wikipedia as well, and I, even for the French. English Wikipedia is a real kiss to riches. It's real research, it's got hundreds of citations, experts for around the world contribute to it. That isn't the case for small languages. The French Wikipedia is absolute bandit country. Lithuanian Wikipedia, which is more or less the same number of speakers as Scots, you can't you can rely on at all. It'll tell you the rank coordinates for what Lithuania is. Like, different cultures and different leads interact with Wikipedia differently. Because Abdi here is bilingual with Scots and English, and I can use both speak hundreds more languages than just them. We hear this idea that Wikipedia is a source of knowledge. Well, it is in English. It is in, in most smaller languages. So it's not to be worried about. But I yeah. make publicity, I, bad publicity. It was, it was good publicity. What I found was that it was the fact that I was totally unaware of it. <laughs> means yeah. that the majority of folk were totally unaware of it. So I just see it as some young boy in Missouri or whatever getting into Scots and fair enough. I, I, I'm not bothered by it at all. Uh, just as somebody getting into quantum physics or getting into cloud formations up in the day, that was his thing. He got into Scots. A, uh, a young boy that's the son of a friend from America says that Scots rocks. Uh, and this young boy, obviously, in America thought that Scots rocks. The fact that he spent so much time trying to learn Scots online, I'm not bothered by that at all. But if it was an official, an official thing that people were actually engaging in, then it would be totally different. But I think he would start by another air. He would just leave him to go on with his thing and create another name for it and just regard it as a bit freaky, which is what it is. Before I, go, before I go to it, Joanna, I'd just like to point out that there have been heaps and heaps of folk on Twitter and on making comments saying, well, I'm just learning about how to write Dune Scots, I spick it, but I dark in how to like, write it. So I have went on to that Wikipedia thing to, in order to educate myself. That means that they've kind of maybe stumbled upon stuff that's no right. So like a lot of the stuff he was writing are pages that made do ginty. Like I say, there's 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 plenty of there's hundreds of actually good pages. He only he did loads, but he didn't do the majority. He did about a third day an impact on about a third of the pages. So most of the pages on there are actually in some sort of decent Scots, and they are they're they're fine. Like it's no it's no the greatest resource out there. There's hundreds of great resources out there. But most of Scots Wikipedia is all right. Like, it's no, it's no, it's no a big story, and it's no that bad news. So this is th th this is exactly what I wanted to to add to that discussion. There are two things I think that are important here. The internet is a bag of stuff. We all have to be very careful when we approach the internet for any kind of information, and this, that's something that we want to. Uh, teach our students how to engage with digital resources responsibly and be able to distinguish what's trustworthy and what's not. And there are various ways of doing it and maybe also looking at uh, how um, a particular notion or, or, or point is, is being described, how, how um, much uh, background reading is suggested for a particular topic, but also who, who, who's behind it, you know, how legitimate that is. And there are so many 
more legitimate sources of information out there. And I think it's the, just the question of, of um, engaging with those curated resources. Uh, I mean, the Scots Language Center produces and hosts a, a plethora of fantastic material for um, Scots learners and for Scots users and, and uh, for everybody. To be honest, you know, when I started doing my work from on Scots from abroad, the Scots Language Center uh, materials were my go-to thing because they were for free, they were online, and they were, you know, legitimate based on on the hard work of, of people who were legitimately uh, re representatives of the Scots community and the work that they did around the um, 2011 census was fantastic and that's what we are all building on right now quoting that number of 1.5 million Scots speakers so I think that's uh, the kind of work that can be legitimately taken as uh, you know our, our base for for further um, engagement with these topics and let's be careful about the internet in general that's my first point the second point just to reiterate uh, what Billy was saying, isn't that fantastic that someone in the States, you know, devotes all their time and tries to do something? I don't think he did it out of spite or in order to invalidate the Scots language in some way, which is something that people have um, ha have suggested he's been doing. I think it's really, you know, if he's done something um, out of ordinary and and maybe not something that Scots speakers would recognize let's have a project let's let's try and correct these things let's turn it into something positive you know not now that this whole thing has broke out as a, as a big scandal yeah. I don't think it should be uh, you know taken as as a doom and gloom but maybe it's a it's an interesting project to follow up on you know why a wee, not a wee point on that the people going mental on Twitter about what a terrible thing this is and uh, how it's one of the worst things that's ever happened. I wish they would devote some of their energy that they've devoted to calling <laughs> this boy in America, devote it to heasing up the lead here in Scotland. Yes. And that would have a much bigger effect rather than, you know, zooming in on one wee guy in America. It is a great point and I think we should be celebrating the fact that your language is is a topic of interest for him and to be honest I did read some of the stuff and it was kind of brutal so we, we should really actually um if he you know we don't know where he is out there in the ethernet but I'm just going to say be part of the community let's learn off of each other we don't want anyone to feel ostracized so if you're listening then give us an, give us an email let's work together and um, that's what Scots is about I feel like Scots really transcends uh, generations, backgrounds, class. And that is what I'm going to come back to just now. So growing up in the Northeast, Doric uh, historically was the firm working, that kind of type thing. As a young female in the 21st century, I really sometimes struggle when I'm sitting doing at boards with high he gins or classical orchestras and all that. And I really sometimes feel a bit sad because I feel like I'm if I speak the way that I'm supposed to speak, you know, the way that's natural, that I'm not going to be taken seriously. How can we fix that crisis of identity when it comes to um, class and dialect? Because I, I don't want folk to think that I'm lower class. I'm, you know, I'm no. But the thing is that, that that's what they do. If you speak like this, they automatically think that. Um, not everyone does. But how can we fix this this crisis of identity? Well, just, you can only fix it by proving it can be done. That's that's it. It's it's coming out as a Scots speaker. It literally is, and showing that it can be done. Because if you if you have mim mood and stay in the corner and don't engage with it and don't show that it can be done, people presume it doesn't exist or it is the language of chuchters or the language of the, the folk that can't speak. So it's tactent or it's ten. Use it or lose it. That's what you have to do. You have to stone up and be it. And that's Ilka buddy that's got a word of Scots in them. Use it. Keep using it and prove that it's a valid medium of communication. I hear what you're saying, Iona, and for some folk it, it, it's harder. And speaking the kind of majority dialect, if you like, West Central Scots, but with a richer Ayrshire twang, it's maybe been easier for me in the past. But but I remember the first time I spoke in public in Scots, Gina talk about the mother tongue, I was nervous as anything. 
they see the weight that come off my shoulders when I did it. And I've had it, that feeling ever since, that this great freedom of being able to speak your mother tongue in places where folk deferred in the past, to be able to speak Ayrshire schools in the Library of Congress in, in the States and places like that, the freedom that that gives you. But I admit, you need confidence to be able to be that. Well, I get confidence for being brought up to be prude on my mother tongue through the family, through Burns, etc., etc., and the fact that it was the, the way of learning other languages. I, I became fluent in other languages because I was bilingual in Scots and English. So there's a few different reasons why we have to overcome that cringe as far as Scots is concerned. You wanna... if, I, if I can add to, to that, I mean, uh, for me, uh, people in Scotland have a huge advantage because you've got two languages at your disposal, if not three, from the very start. And that's something people don't necessarily see as, as a positive thing. People are told off for having that home language uh, as well as part of their linguistic resource. I'm quite jealous of it, you know? It's fantastic to be growing up with something, with, with, with a multitude of languages that you can uh, use for different purposes, you can use with different audiences, you can nip in and out of different registers, depending on the, the, the occasion, the people you're talking to, but also embracing the fact that you are a bilingual speaker and uh, promote that language that you probably don't necessarily feel that, that confident using, but just try and make those new uses for yourself. I think that would be amazing. And, and to be honest, you know, um, I've been trying to learn bits of Scots um, myself. I'm not doing very well. I'm, I'm good at reading historical stuff, but I'm not very good at using Scots nowadays because I don't have the confidence of a new Scots speaker. There isn't anything. I mean, I've, I, I know some people who have done it and I really applaud them, uh, but it's a difficult thing to to get through in your head, like in order for people to, to think I'm not making fun of them. I, I'm really conscious of, of that. So uh, I guess for native speakers of Scots, it's also that switch that has to happen in the head. Like it's not something to be afraid of. It's not something to be, um, I don't know, reluctant to use in different contexts that you're normally used to or expected to. But I, I just wanted to say, I, I'm really jealous of, of that continuum that you can use and, and you know, um, just be proud bilinguals. I, I, I guess that would be my, my message if, if I'm in the, the right place to make one. <laughs> Ali, what, what are you thinking about that? You remind us of the question, because I was just listening to Joanna there. It was a really good chat. <laughs> I think the question was like, how do we get a laugh with the idea that if you speak uh, Scots or Doric, I'd just like to point out just, just one wee second. Sure. We've had a comment which said, Scots is all Scots, no just Doric. And I wasn't saying that. I, I wasn't saying that. <laughs> that we all end Doric up. separatists. Yeah. 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 Like, I'm not saying that, that's just my background. When I was talking about Doric, I was talking about my background and why that I was brought up. I'm not saying that, that Scots and Doric are like, it's the main thing. I'm well aware um, and I've I've learned ballads and bothy ballads that are from the borders and they speak in borders. You know, it's not just Doric that I'm punting, it's Scots. So yeah, I never said that all Scots is just Doric, just for the record, by the way. Um, yes. So I, Ali, the question was, how do we get a laugh for the idea that speaking Scots um, or speaking whatever regional dialect you choose is kind of related with the working class? Because historically, in my area, the Northeast, it was related with kind of farm workers and all that, fisher folk. Right. So, how do we get a laugh for that? If we Good have question. Obviously, Ahun would speak about the night, Ken, getting a Scots language act, which is what your voice is all about, getting a mayor's status, getting it used in media, it's all part of it. But you'd also hate to look at Ertsy Scotland where about they just speak it and Arnie that fear about it. Like doing in Hoik, it, Abdi just speaks it. It isn't a work. I mean, Hoik's a kind of working working tune, but it's no like Ken. It's no like an urban uh, centre like Glasgow or that. Like Hoik is its own place, and they speak Scots all over the place. And they hate to change gear into English if somebody fae that comes in a boot fae some other pair. So I'd say that there's plenty of parts of Scotland where Scots is already and has I been in that position where you didn't hate to change it. I've had a bit of a shock to my system, truth be told, just flitted to Dundee and man, folk are 
fear of the rain Scots here. They are fear of the rain Scots. So they'll use it all the time, but only with the rain folk and only in working class scenarios. And I got tell off. I'm 30 years old. I was tell off by the dental assistant of a new dentist I was going to check up in. Because I said, she was like, oh, um, so you're moving dentist, obviously. Where is it you're from? I was like, well, I'm Faye Angus, but I've just moved over to Amsterdam. And she's like, oh, Faye, huh, bit weird. Like, and was like freaked, but she was a working class Scottish person, but she just felt that that lead wasn't right in that context. So there's definitely mere discomfort around it in Dundee than there is, what I'm Faye, 10 miles outside of Dundee. Um, and I, so it's mere, it's mere uh, different regions will hey, distinct approach required. Can I just give a quick shout out to the fantastic Hoik teacher who got the uh, award at the Scots Language Awards? Uh, I thought it was amazing. So she she's an English uh, teacher in a Scottish school in the borders. I don't remember her name. I'm really, really sorry. But I just felt it was such a fantastic thing to be awarded for, uh, the promotion of the Scots language in the local school. And, and uh, she's doing a fantastic job uh, alongside many other teachers who have embraced that opportunity that the new SQA award has brought about. Uh, so just a quick, quick shout out to her. Brilliant. Well, I think, I mean, we lost Billy for a wee bit, so I'm inclined to kind of go over the time limit just to mack up for lost time when he went, went into the Ethernet. So um, I've just got like a wee, a wee question here that, um, that I thought was, thought was quite interesting. Um, it was more of a statement and a question together. Can we please stop raising grievances about the past? It seems to me that's well behind the curve and in truth, Scots is enjoying a revival with no reason why it can't flourish in the future, bored or not. Language is about communication. My focus is on spoken Scots. There will always be occasions when we have to moderate our particular vice and there's nothing cringeworthy about that. What do you guys think of that? I think that's, yeah, what do you think? Hey. I'm not quite sure, because it's a statement, there's that many different uh, parts to it. I mean, I agreed with a lot of what the person, what the person said, uh, but when you've, when you've had my experience, as I say, uh, four steps for it, three steps back, that's the way it is, and that's the way it's I been. So I have to, I have to articulate my experience, uh, but as soon as I've got anything positive to celebrate about advances that are made in Scots, I'll do that. And we all do that. But we've, we've come to, I think, crucial stages in the development. And that's why your advice is important, because some kind of language recognition act is central to the future, I think. I mean, if you cherish Scots as a leaving thing, then it has to be supported. And because it's a leaving thing, and because like German and French and English taught in schools, it has to have money behind it. So it has to have government support. So all of these things are necessary for us to advance the what we are just now. And you know, I would like to I'd like to be happy, clappy and saying it's all luck and great. It's no, and that's why we're here tonight, because it's no luck and great, and we need to be a lot more the max sick of that it bides on into the middle of the 21st century. Joanna. I'll give you an example of a minority language from Spain. And it's not Catalan, it's Galician. So it's a smaller language and it doesn't enjoy as much prestige as Catalan does in Catalonia. And it's probably not as, as, as well known. However, Junta de Galicia, which is the local government in, in that region, sponsors courses in Galician at British universities. So that's the kind of investment into the internationalization and normalization of Galician as a language, which actually has a very similar history to Scots, you know, with the loss of prestige um, and, and then Spanish coming over and taking, uh, taking over. Um, so there are pockets in, in Europe, there are other stories which are very, very similar and the governments have taken it upon themselves to promote the languages and the culture that is built um, with, with the use of, of these languages and to promote the, the, um, 
the, the language and its its culture abroad, not only uh, in the in the local area. So it's it's even it goes without saying that there is a, a, a an MSc qualification in Galician at Santiago de Compostela University. It's just normal. Whereas, as I was saying earlier, there isn't such a qualification available for Scots users and speakers here. So I think having a Scots language act will legitimize these um, activities that we, 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 you know, it would be normal for a language of that of that kind to have elsewhere. I think Scotland has a, a little bit to, of catching up to do. Hi, that's, that's, that's exactly it. Your, your pal's statement there, I mean, elements say I sort of get where it's coming from, but the, the, <laughs> the glacatry is saying, cow put your learning for the last century. Uh, no, just like it's, like we can where we are. We can exactly where we are today. And that's no in the worst position Scots has been in for the last century, but it's no in a great position. And we hate to just, we hate to hate these conversations. We hate to, we hate to grab the sort of the jaggy bush and accept that Scots isn't in a great position. There's work to be done to get there. The reason it isn't in that good position is for these two, three, four good reasons. We hate to change perceptions around it and mark the changes. And then, and then, into is normal. Into is just studied as part of university courses. Into you can get into Waterstones and there's books on Ilka's subject in Scots. Then we can be mere chill about it. Then we can just treat it as only other lead. And if you if you want to use it, use it. If you didn't, you didn't. Like, but we we didn't have the privilege just now. Oh no, making these efforts. I'd rather can. Well, anyway. So an interesting question has came in, and I guess this I I can't. I'm not very clued up on this, but that's for you guys. Um. So the Scots Language Act would see the development of a Scots Language Board. How would we make sure that this board operates efficiently? That's really important. Billy, what's your thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> I'm not the best person in the world to to, uh, to answer who bones what. I mean, I've never sat in one in my life, so I'm not the best person. But there's a, the, the people with the expertise are there. The big difference between Gaelic and Scots is that Gaelic has had funded professional people in positions for over 100 years. Scots has had half a dozen folk working twice, one and a half days a week for 20 or 30 years. That's the major difference. I would love to devote all my time to the Scots language and be a professional in promoting the Scots language. And like me, hunters, I can think of three or four folk across the water in Dundee who would love to do the same thing, but it's support and that is political. And I come back to the political thing. No party political, but it means that the, the people who support the culture of Scotland have to invest some cellar in the promotion of Scots. Alistair? I know we hey models to follow. We hey good structures, a eh, what a board should do. And we can know that engagement is key to the whole Scots hang, because a board will not get legitimacy for the government alone. The board will get legitimacy for engaged members of the community and for the wider Scots speaking movement. We hear a Scots language centre now. May Scots speakers didn't can exist. So it doesn't hear that legitimacy. But we we effective outreach, we effective engagement, that board would get the legitimacy and folk would be paying attention. It also hate to operate with transparency as all government boards do. So I don't think there's only there's, there's already good organisations in, in a lot of parts of Scotland. In Shetland, you had good organisation, you had the Doric Board in the North East. There are already regional and local groups for a national board to engage we. So it's not like they'll hit a start to scratch on that. So we'll get its efficacy, or efficacy, or have you pronounced that in English? Isn't it very good? Sorry, second language. But you get um, all these, you mark the connections that are already there, and the board will be made to be effective because it's part of the government. Joanna, what's your thoughts on, on that? How can I, we... I think we'll kind of cross that bridge when we come to, to it, when we see what lies ahead, because I think the, the way for the board to operate is to make sense and to steer things forward. And 
we don't yet know what these things will be in a, in a few years time you know priorities change and uh, maybe there will be some things that need more more effort and, and more emphasis so i wouldn't say you know at the moment we don't really have a recipe for that we don't really have a set of people i i, I quite agree with billy it should be experts but i also agree with with ali that it should be uh, very much tuned into the the community and I, th I think you were both making that point so i think you know at the moment i wouldn't fret about the boards and and setups and and strategies in that sense let's get the act and let's see where it gets us brilliant and there has been i'm going to do two more questions and then i'll let you off to go your bed you for this uh, okay well wait, we can go for as long as you want whatever okay um someone asked a very important question so once this gets passed in government in reality what's the day-to-day -day output not to sound ignorant but are we suddenly going to have gallic english and scots translate translations listed everywhere train stations polis vans can we answer that why you know? okay billy you go first <laughs> why no hey Pol polis we'll use the the swedish polis hey I will have places like Aberdeen on the signpost, and we'll have uh, Scots place names in, in in railway stations. It's a lot more relevant for Scots place names to be in Alpine places in Scotland than to have some neologistic uh, Gaelic invented place names. Some of them are genuinely Gaelic place names, but others aren't. They? So I, you would want that. To begin with, you wouldn't need everything. Uh, translated into the three official leads, uh, the way it is in the European Union, where everything has to be translated into the different ones. Because everybody's bilingual in Scots and English, there would be no need for a wee things. But visibility is important. It's important that, for example, signage in the Scottish Parliament would be in Scots, Gaelic and English, again, for the reason of status. And it would be important to see Scots runabouti, no just in tea towels, no just in wee tourist bags, no just in wee bookies, but all over the place. To show that this is a Scots-speaking country that has got a history going back a thousand years and one of the most brilliant literatures in Europe, eh, the 1300 to the present day. So it's important for all these things to be seen mm -hmm. in the if I could, okay, if I could just, can I just it, ask you about day-to-day -day output? What is the day-to-day -day output of this act? That's what folk, I think that's what a lot of folk are wanting to know. What is it going to change? So the board would work together. We, uh, for example, the universities. The university is the new work with the Gaelic language board to develop Gaelic plans for their universities. That is to make sure that the signage is in place, to make sure that the staff are given the option of learning it, is to make sure that if there is the opportunity to use it mere within that business or that organization, it's geared that. And if that university feels it needs expertise and guidance and support, it gets that to the board. So the Scots would do exactly the same job. They'd be getting to Edinburgh University, Aberdeen, Glasgow, all, all the universities saying, what do you need to make sure that Scots speakers within your organization are nurtured and thriving? And what can your organization do to reflect the Scots speaking reality in the region? Any of the things the Gaelic board did that I like, because I'm, I'm a history graduate, is all around the West Coast, only place that is either traditionally Gaelic speaking or about 40% of the population are Gaelic speaking, all the signs on historical monuments you visit are in both English and Gaelic. So you're getting around Sky, all the, like the, the kilt rock and all that, all the signs are in both Gaelic and English. Now, as Billy says, most people that speak Gaelic are bilingual with English but it gives it status and it gives it presence. In Scots, we'd hear exactly the same. So you'd get to Five Bay Castle, which Abdur in there is a Scots speaker. And you'd hear, or the Ahen would be naturally bilingual. And you'd get that down in the borders and you'd get that in Edinburgh. You'd get it in places. So ah, you would get that bilingual signage, but you'd also get at universities, they'd be, they'd be tell, use hey today something. What, is your, what are you gonna do to support Scots speakers within your staff? And we in your student body. So ah, you'd see you'd see a muckle shift or the first five year. And it'd be in visibility, but you'd also be in you'd also be activating all the other institutions around Scotland today, some progressive for Scots. Brilliant. 
Brilliant. Joanna, let's, let's see what you have. I'll, I'll just say something very, very quick, because I agree with everything that's been said already. I think parity is also the word. So we already have the Scots Gal the um, Gaelic Act. We have the British Sign Language Act. Uh, out of the indigenous languages that need protected in Scotland, Scots doesn't have that. So, you know, it's just a question of of getting there and, and getting it done. It, it's a question of parity for me. And, and things follow from, from there on, as Ali said, in the workplace and also in the institutions that need their own uh, individual language policies for, for their staff. And their, there will be real benefits to it. And I think, um, you know, the Scots users deserve it. Um, so there shouldn't be a question about that, really. That's absolutely incredibly important, given given people protection about speaking the way that they speak. I was recently working with an organisation who deals primarily in traditional music, and they were telling me that if they are running a project which has um, a Gaelic element to it, then if they're applying for funding, then usually they get funded quite well if they have a Gaelic element. However, if they say, we've got a Scots element to it too, we're having some Scots musicians, Scots singers or whatever, they don't get that same funding. So perhaps a language act will open the door to way, way more funding for, you know, whatever it be, music, art, creative, academic, it, it doesn't matter, just funding in the, in the broadest term. So that's that is really important. I've got this question and it's quite quite vague. What is the what is the most muckle risk to Scots the day? What's the biggest risk that Scots is facing the day? Billy? Ignorance. Shorts. Ignorance. Just the fact that people uh, haven't been educated and they uh, come away we come away with stuff about Scots that is just profoundly, profoundly ignorant. So the first thing we have to do to promote Scots is to obliterate the ignorance, to tell folk really the history of their language. That's the main thing against Scots, is the ignorance of Scottish folk about their own language and their own culture. I'd add transmission to it. So transmission, generational transmission, so that Scots is being actively picked up by kids uh, and not just, you know, a word or two, you know, uh, your bairn or your bonnie or, or whatever uh, fashionable word there is, uh, but the active grammar and structures and vocabulary and the confidence to use them. I think transmission is, is key to sustaining the language. Ali? Hi, for me, I mean, I'm focused on my wee world and it's like, I'm all about, Scots speakers aren't they thriving with their language because a lot of them are marginalised themselves. So it's about creating an environment where they're empowered is uh, what I'm interested in the new. Brilliant. Well, I think that that tacks us to a really natural close. So I'm going to thank um, our panellists, Billy Kay, Alistair Heather and Joanna Kopachik again for giving more of their time um, to, to have this discussion. So a big round of applause for, for you all. So Abdi, um, if you're watching the night, can you please, please follow your advice on both Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Um, we have just launched our website yesterday um, and you can now become a member of your advice and uh, come to our meetings, be involved with um, what we're doing with this Language Act. Um, the links are in the Facebook description. Uh, you can join our mailing list or uh, choose to become a member. Um, thank you so, so much for listening. Of course, we can carry on the conversation over on Twitter or whatever. If you've got questions, then please still spear at us. Uh, we won't get to them the night, but um, you can easily, easily find Joanna, Billy and Ali on, on every social media going. Um, so thank you so, so much. This is going to be saved, hopefully, to Facebook for re-watching. So if you've got pals, grannies, whatever, dugs that you want to, you know, you say that was a good conversation, re-watch it. It's going to be online. Um, and hopefully we're going to have another roundtable sometime soon. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. So I'm going to now log off. Um, brilliant. Thanks. <laughs>